So nutrient, that term is defined as anything uh, acquired from your environment and used for your cellular activities. Um, you need nutrients in order to build your cells and have your um, have your actual cell, you know, be able to replicate and everything like that, the functions of the cell, that's what I'm trying to say. Anyways, so there are different kinds. We already know um, kind of a little bit about the elements because we, you guys took chemistry and I'm sure you guys talked a little bit about this stuff. So I'm not gonna make you guys list these out necessarily, but I would be aware of the first, the most important ones, the six most important ones. We're gonna talk about what they are and how they play a role in the micro life in general. Life in general too, not just microbes. So uh, any essential nutrient is anything that um, must be provided to the organism. There might be other nutrients that they can use to like make you know things work better, but if they have to have it, that's essential, obviously. So the C-H-O-N-P-S, these are the elements that are associated most closely with, uh, I guess, the top six elements that are uh, used to build cells, basically. So this is going to be carbon, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Literally, they're chemical signs, right? They're, they're, they're names. So uh, symbols, whatever you want to call them. It's literally, they're symbols. Um, so chomps, like with an N. And uh, that's how what we're going to be building our cells out of. So macronutrients versus micronutrients. The macronutrients are the things that we need in large quantities. Most of these are our macromolecules, uh, our biological macromolecules that we've already been talking about. Carbohydrates, lipids, which, you know, hey, that's fats, right? Um, and then nucleic acids and proteins. So the big three, whenever you are eating your food, probably are gonna be your carbs, your fats, and then um, your protein, right? So same thing for them. Let's see. We have the inorganic nutrients and the organic. We already know what organic means. That's the same thing applying here as it does in the past. I and mean, it's just gonna be carbon, hydrogen based. Um, and these are our inorganic reservoirs for these elements. They did not originally come from an organic source. Some organism put them into an organic form, and then we were able to use them in that form. First, though, everything was inorganic. And this is just where you could find all of these in their inorganic settings uh, prior to being incorporated into some sort of organic molecule. OK, these terms. Now, we have the carbon sources. Uh, if you are a heterotroph, heterotrophs are going to be organisms that obtain their carbon in organic form from other life forms. So some other life form put the carbon in that organic form. We're even talking about like cows, like this isn't talking that like herbivores still fall into this, right? Because cows are still eating grass and what is grass made of? Organic molecules. So they, they here we're talking about, there are some aspects of some of the molecules that they cannot make from inorganic sources. I mean, do you get all of your nutrients from inorganic sources? No, right? Most of ours are from organic sources. So then we would fall into heterotroph here. Where does your carbon come from? If you got it from some other organism, fixing it into organic form, you're a heterotroph. If you got it because you were able to use inorganic carbon to make organic molecules, uh, like plants do, right? They are literally fixing carbon dioxide and turning it into organic molecules. That's what photosynthesis is for. So they can use that inorganic carbon dioxide as their carbon source and turn it into other organic compounds through chemistry. But um, they are autotrophs. So remember troph, we've already talked about troph being related to eating or feeding. Um, when we talk about the trophozoites versus the cysts with the protozoans, right? The trophozoites were the ones that were eating. They were the metabolically active ones. Um, same thing here, troph is referring to feed. So autotroph, you're feeding yourself basically, uh, making your own organic sources. Where do we get nitrogen from? Most of uh, the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. We know that, N2, uh, nitrogen gas. Um, and so there are bacteria that can um, either turn the N2 into something useful or convert other forms of nitrogen, like nitrate and nitrite, into other forms of nitrogen, like ammonia. 
Most organisms cannot use nitrogen unless it is in the ammonia form. Um, we can't, and a lot of other uh, animals can't either, but plants specifically is the important one here, okay? So plants, they need it to be converted to uh, ammonia, that NH3, that's what we're talking about with ammonia, right? Or NH4 plus, if you've ever seen it written that way. Same thing here, but that's ammonia. And you need nitrogen for your nitrogenous bases and your DNA and your RNA, as well as in your amino acids, amino group is NH2, right? So we know just in their like setup that we know that we need a lot of nitrogen to make the cells work. So uh, we need a lot of either ammonia-based or fixed into some sort of organic compound already, right? Um, we and plants can't use nitrate or nitrite. And so what happens is our uh, the bacteria in the soil will convert nitrate and nitrite or even um, nitrogen in the atmosphere, depending on the organism, um, into a, the ammonia form that the plants can utilize or into some other organic form that the plants can utilize. Uh, plants will not live, be able to live and get their nitrogen um, without there being bacteria there to do that for them. Or like if you feed them the ammonia-based compound, sure, but that doesn't happen naturally in the soil, right? So um, if you are a farmer and you're not feeding nitrogen, uh, ammonia-based compounds typically to your plants, you're relying on the soil to do that for you. Uh, which is why now that we have everything getting too hot outside and the bacteria can't grow as well in the high heat, that's why we're losing a lot of bacteria that provide nitrogen to the plants and why a lot of countries are not able to grow crops um, and they have a lot of populations starving right now and will continue to do so. All right. Growth factors. We remember this term, right? Anything that you have to have supplied to you that you can't make for yourself is a growth factor. We talked about vitamins that we need to get in our diet because our body can't make those vitamins. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. Vitamin C, vitamin B12, both of those are great examples that a lot of us are familiar with. Your body doesn't make those. You have to get them from your diet, right? And if you don't, you get disease, right? We see disease developing due to lack of nutrition. Um, a lot of those, a lot of those can uh, be associated as well with uh, some essential amino acids like tryptophan. Our body doesn't make tryptophan. We have to get it from our food. But when we get a lot of it from our food, our body has to sort of slow down and focus on prepping it and using it and getting ready to use it. Um, and that takes a lot of energy and that can make you feel tired. That's why that happens. Okay, so we've talked about um, the carbon source. We talked about the heterotrophs versus the autotrophs. And now we're going to be breaking that even further down into energy sources. So are they getting their energy from the sun? The only ones I need you to care about are the sun or not the sun, basically. <laughs> okay. Um, organic compounds are the ones we're going to be focusing on the most. I'm really not going to be talking anything at all about uh, the litho anything. So the ones that are getting stuff from inorganic sources. So those are just like few and far between, and they don't have a lot to do with what we study in this class. So uh, autotroph, remember that's gonna be carbon uh, coming from an inorganic source and making it into organic molecules yourself, right? That's the carbon source. Photo means that you're getting energy from the sun. I know it seems obvious, but you do need to know the difference between the photo part of it, like photo phototroph um, and the auto part of it, right? So there's two things going on there. The auto is dealing with the carbon source and the photo is dealing with the energy source. Two different things there. Um, so same thing with chemo. We're talking about a chemo autotroph. These are things that can actually make, um, you know, they don't use sunlight as energy. They use their, their nutrients, but they're inorganic compounds that they use. So I'm not really talking about those again. Meth methanogens, these are usually gonna be archaea, who cares? I don't even know. So mostly photoautotrophs and chemoheterotrophs are the ones that I care about you guys understanding. So number one up here, and then these two guys down here, these are the ones that I am the most concerned with. Um, chemoheterotroph, that's us. Yeah, we get our energy from chemicals, our food that we eat, we're not getting it from the sun. Um, so we're getting it from the food that we eat by breaking it down and turning it into energy. We're going to be talking about that in chapter 10, exactly how that works. Um, so that's our energy is chemo. 
And then heterotroph, again, like we mentioned, we're getting organic compounds made by other organisms. That's what we get our carbon from. Cool. So those are the two terms I care about. Uh, photo, autotroph, and chemoheterotrophs. Okay. Uh, good. This is just reiterating basically exactly what I was just saying. Mm, energy sources as well as carbon and stuff. Okay. Next, we have, I'm telling you guys about how, like in chapter 10, we're going to talk about metabolism and how we get our energy and everything like that. But better to have a little bit of a primer into that than jump into it completely like new babes into the wild winds or whatever. So um, if you haven't had physiology, and I know most of you haven't, but um, those of you that haven't, we're talking primarily about, in metabolism, aerobic respiration. And when I say chemo, uh, chemo heterotrophs like us, remember hetero being organic compounds, but the chemo is the energy. So we break down our food to get energy. What does that mean and how does that happen? It's not as simple as just knowing that. You don't get to get away with that one. Sorry, guys. You have to actually know chemically what is going on. In this class as well as in physiology, I promise you. So um, that's aerobic respiration in our bodies. This is why you breathe in oxygen and why you exhale carbon dioxide. Remember I explained to you in the beginning of the semester, the carbon dioxide that you breathe out is not at all from the oxygen that you breathed in. That oxygen associated with the carbon dioxide you're breathing out did not come from the same place at all, 0%. And how does that work and everything like that? That luckily is gonna be in chapter 10. We're gonna break down the chemistry of all that, but using glucose and turning that into energy, which is ATP. We are not literally taking glucose molecules and literally turning them into ATP. That is not what happens in metabolism, okay? We're talking about breaking bonds. You guys already know there's energy in bonds, yeah? Um, we're gonna be breaking bonds, releasing energy, and using the energy from breaking the bond to generate and store that energy into ATP, essentially, is how that works. Um, so using a DP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and popping another phos phosphate group on there, which it doesn't want to because it's negatively charged. We've got three negatively charged things and they're pushing each other apart and they don't want to be near each other. That's where all the energy is stored in ATP. That is literally what powers everything in yourself. It is the reason, I know I've probably said it before, but it's one of my favorite analogies. It is the reason that if, you know, I were to, uh, instead of you guys coming and killing me and doing this investigation, if I go in and kill, killed you guys, and I don't know, smothered you with a pillow, let's say, um, if you run out of oxygen, because you see that glucose plus oxygen equals those things that are made, if you run out of oxygen, that whole process can't go. You suffocate, not just because you run out of oxygen, you suffocate and die because you run out of ATP and you can't make ATP without oxygen there as part of the process. <clears throat> That's why you die. That's literally why you die. You run out of energy. Your cells need it so much. We talked about how your cells need it, um, sure, in all these processes to make all of these proteins and whatever, blah, blah, blah. That makes enough sense. But moving everything around in the cell, that requires ATP energy. Getting things in and out of the cell that are going against gradients, that requires ATP. And a lot of that, like your nerve signals, depend on that, right? Um, so there's a lot of energy involved in your cells constantly using up energy. Um, that ATP, if you aren't able to replenish that constantly as well, um, then you die. That is why you die, from suffocation at least. Um, not if you get stabbed, right? That's not the same. So <laughs> uh, maybe it kind of is though, actually, if you're losing the blood and you try to break it down being the same thing. But anyways, uh, so this whole thing, plants, plants, of course, what can they do? They can take carbon dioxide, which is inorganic, and it's one of our waste products, and turn it into an organic compound. It turns out that the organic compound they usually are trying it into is glucose, or at least glucose-based. Um, they can use it for building things too, but it's usually they want to get energy. Because this aerobic respiration, glucose plus oxygen with our byproducts of carbon dioxide, water, and then our goal is energy, right? ATP, that is like the A number one best way to get energy for yourself by far. We're talking about 38 ATP molecules being made per glucose molecule that goes into this. Um, there is absolutely nothing else in the cell that can come close to matching that. So what plants do, they use light energy 
to make a little bit of ATP that powers making glucose out of carbon dioxide and then use that glucose to put it through the same exact thing that we do, aerobic respiration. That's actually why if you have plants, we know they need carbon dioxide for fixing that into organic molecules, but they also need oxygen. So if you push a plant in a vacuum or like it doesn't, you know, it's airtight, whatever, it'll die. It needs oxygen too, not just carbon dioxide. Think about that for a minute. But anyway, so that's what we're going to be getting into in chapter 10. And why I'm uh, giving you that primer, because it's like one of the most important functions that your body is ever going to do. And I feel like it's very, very under taught that along with immunology. But all right. Um, sap robes, sap robes break things down, dead things down, right? Just decomposing things, um, dead things usually. And then uh, this is the bacteria and the fungi. So they usually what, what they do is they can't heat up large particles. So what they do is they have enzymes that break down molecules of their food, basically. And then they can take that up, heat that up into their cells. And then that's what they're going to be using for um, eating. So that but they have to have exoenzymes, right? They're going to exo being outside enzymes because that's what they're doing, the enzymes. But yeah, this is just an example. Yeah, there's stuff outside and we put our enzymes out and it broke it down and we took it up. That's all that's happening there. So uh, here's our nice little words again. We've already talked about obligate, right? We haven't focused too much yet on facultative. But um, obligate means you have to do the thing, right? You're obligated to do the thing. So if you're an obligate sap robe, you only, you're strictly going to be eating on decomposing matter right? Decomposing matter. You're going to be the one doing the decomposing. So that's all you're going to be doing. For facultative, anything that is facultative, anything, that means you can kind of go in between based on needs. Most bacteria are facultative anaerobes. And what that means is if there's oxygen available, they're going to go through that high quality uh, stepwise thing that we talked about in this, this uh, chemical equation here. If they have oxygen available, they can do this. However, unlike most of the cells in your body, um, and your body cannot rely on this, but they're just single cellular organisms. If they don't have enough oxygen, then they will go through something called fermentation. It makes like crap amounts of ATP. It's like two molecules for every glucose that they put through um, in that situation. And you have byproducts for that, right? We know you can make acids as a, as a byproduct. If you ever had like uh, kimchi or something like that, um, lactic acid is usually a common one there. Uh, gas. So like bubbles, what you get in like your beer, whenever you're fermenting and then obviously alcohol, right? So there's a product of that, but they are using, they can switch. They're facultative. So they can go anaerobic, they don't need oxygen, then they do fermentation, or they can go aerobic like us. I don't know what facultative actually means as a word. Um, I don't know what that is about, but yeah, obligate, I know what that means. So they're always going to be um, either obligate or facultative, both fall into one category or another. So facultative uh, sap robe, for example, they would be able, um, they don't have to eat dead or decaying things. A lot of times if they are facultative sap robes, they're gonna be facultative parasites, meaning that um, you can cause disease in a host in one situation, um, depending on you know the health of the host. That's why they say opportunistic infections and stuff like that, but we're gonna talk about those soon. Parasites live on your body. Some of them cause, they should, usually if they're called a parasite, they're going to be causing you harm somehow. You might not know that it's causing you harm, but that's what they're doing. That's the definition of a parasite. They're causing damage to your body and benefiting from it. So, and they have to do these things in order to survive. Um, so we're calling all of these parasites pathogens because they are causing damage to your tissues. Uh, we have viruses that counts as a pathogen. Obviously, if you get an infection like salmonella, that's a pathogen, right? And these are all parasites. They're all living off of you and causing harm to you. Um, viruses count as that as well. So causing harm to you, but they have to use you, right? We called them viruses like at the bottom. That's, that's what we would call them. Obligate intracellular 
parasites. So they're obligate parasites. They're causing harm always to the host. Viruses are intracellular um, because they have to be inside of the cell to function. And then the bacteria, some bacteria are like that and some protozoa are like that, it just depends. But always viruses, right? Uh, whoops. Yeah, okay. Uh, nutrient absorption. Okay, we have to get things, our nutrients into the cell somehow. We know that the cell membrane is semi-permeable. Remember how we had discussed how it can transport like water molecules and other tiny little um, non-polar molecules across, but most things can't cross naturally across the lipid bilayer. So that's a problem. But that's where all of our in and out happens is at the cell membrane. So how are we going to be controlling it? How are we going to be allowing that to happen and everything like that? So uh, there's a whole lot of reasons um, that uh, you want your cell to be protected from what's outside and keep what's inside inside, but you also need to have some sort of mechanism to control that if you want it to change. Diffusion. I know you've heard of diffusion. I'm sure you understand about diffusion, but just real quickly, diffusion, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Think of a pile of bouncy balls, and then if you let that pile go, it's just going to roll all over the place until it's like flat, right? That's diffusion. That's literally diffusion. That's actual diffusion. But here we're talking about molecular level, right? Um, things like water can diffuse naturally across the membrane. You guys know where I'm going with this, right? Osmosis. Yeah. Get ready. <laughs> Here's osmosis. So we've already said our membrane can transport water across it. So one of the molecules that diffuses across is water. When water diffuses, it's called osmosis. It has its own little name. Um, right, what do I say? Membrane is either selectively or differentially permeable. We have passageways that are controlled somehow usually. Um, and th they can be um, dependent on diffusion, but specifically when we talk about water, it can diffuse across the membrane um, to accommodate different concentrations of solute and solvent that it might be in. So if you are a cell, um, and you know, I'm sure you guys know this, inside of your cell, we have the goo, cytoplasm. All the cells are filled with cytoplasm, no matter if you're bacteria or us. So you have cytoplasm, and it needs like 95% water. And just like the rest of the body, um, there's other molecules in there, maybe salts, um, just components of whatever's going on in the cell and whatever else, and buffers to keep everything pH happy. Um, all sorts of molecules like that, but 95% of it is water. When you put that whole situation into um, salt, just say straight up salt, right? So it leaches the water out, right? Why does the water come out of the cell? Because there's less water on the outside. So it's trying to equalize the concentration of the water specifically on both sides of the membrane. Because we can't move the salt necessarily, it can't transport naturally across the membrane, we'll move the water to try to make it an equal concentration on both sides. That's chemistry. It wants to do that. It wants things to be equal at equilibrium on both sides of that membrane. So if all you can move is the water, then you get put in this salt and you're going to just shoot all your water out across your cell membrane to try to equal out and reach equilibrium. But you can't, right? So that's why sometimes if you pack things in salt or in a very, very salty solution, that can be something that actually protects it from microbes and stuff like that. So that is useful. But anyways, we kind of understand a little bit about osmosis. We can move the water across, but the larger molecules can't move. They get trapped, let's see, say in this little, little sack here. And um, the water on the outside basically wants to water down the solution on the inside. Um, it's not equal. So the water's gonna rush in and fill up that little bag to try to water down and make things equal. It never can, no, but it's gonna keep trying, okay? <laughs> if things are equal on both sides, amount of salt inside the cell. We have the 95% water inside the cell. If it's like 95% water outside the cell too, that's isotonic. So they're equal on both sides. That's what your body is always trying to maintain in general, um, that isotonic condition. If you get into a bathtub, 
Um, and it is just pure water. Like you just put water in from the tap. I guess it's not pure, right? Because especially if you live in Bethany, mm -hmm. it's not, <laughs> not going to be pure water, but it might have stuff dissolved in it. But in general, let's say if it's pure water, your cells are going to see that that's pure water. They have stuff in them. And so they will take in the water. I know you guys like look at your fingers. And you're like, yeah, but my fingers shrivel. No, they don't. The cells in your fingers are actually expanding, but you have these anchor points all throughout because of your extracellular matrix holding in place. It looks like it's wrinkled from shrinking. It's actually expanding. And that's what actually happened. Did I blow your mind? Just <laughs> so the things you learn. Um, anyways, so that's the idea of why you want to have everything equal on both sides of the cell, right? Keep the cell happy, um, hypotonic, and that. That's exactly what I just described to you. It's like uh, pure water on the outside, and then on the inside, we have stuff dissolved in it. Um, so the water uh, will come in to try to dilute what's inside and come in and come in and come in and come in to try to dilute what's inside. Cells, if they don't have walls or they don't have some sort of thing to anchor them in place or control this, they can burst from this. So they'll just literally swell up and pop. Because their saltiness can't be diluted enough by pure in pure water. It's just never going to happen, right? Um, so they'll just shoop, swell up with water as it's trying to do that chemically, and then they burst. Um, that's called lysis, right? You guys remember that. We also have hypertonic conditions where that's what I was describing with the salt. Hypertonic, a lot of the tonic going on. So um, in this case, high salt outside of the cell, causing the cell to try to push water out to make it equal outside, to water it down in its environment outside of it. And now we're shrinking up our cells in this particular case. Um, and that can also uh, cause osmotic pressure is what causes that. The pressure that is forced, forcing the water out of the cell is the osmotic pressure um, due to being exposed to the salt. That can cause um, cells to shrink up to the point that they die. It's called plasmolysis. I think that's the word for it, but I guess it is. Okay, so here's some pictures of everything I'm talking about. Isotonic, equal on both sides. We're happy. There's always, I'm sure you guys are probably sick of hearing about it from chemistry. The molecules are never not moving, right? They're always doing the molecule thing. So they're always crossing in and out of the membrane anyway, the water molecules are, but in this case, it's equal rate of, you know, of travel. But um, anyways, equal on both sides, equal, everybody's just chilling. If we have hypotonic, I put you into a pure water and now your cell is swelling up, trying to dilute itself out, then uh, you could burst easily if you don't have a cell wall to keep your shape. Um, yeah, yeah, so bursting. Um, and then hypertonic, so hyper, again, a lot. So outside of you, you have a lot of salt. Um, that will cause your cells to shrink in. And now you see in this particular picture, this pink mess on the outside is your cell wall. So it's not gonna be affected by that, but your cell membrane and everything in it is gonna be shriveling up inside of that as a bacterium. And this whole process is called plasmolysis, and that can be deadly to bacteria as well. Uh, gram positives, because they do have um, these cell walls that can help with maintaining the stability of these, uh, this whole situation in the hypertonic situation, uh, gram positives are a little bit more suited for salty environments. And that shouldn't be too surprising because if you think about the gram positives on your skin, like staph, staph is normal. Um, staph aureus, really only about 4% of the population has it, but it's still around, right? One of the most common types of bacteria on your skin will be Staphylococcus epidermidis, in the name, right? Um, so just normal stuff. Those guys, gram positive, they can withstand the salt a little bit better than the gram negatives can. Yeah. They're better suited for the changes anyways. Um, Cause I don't know if you know this, but your skin, the outside of your skin is pretty salty. Um, I don't know if you've ever licked somebody's skin, but, but it is a little saltier. I don't know. Um, so some organisms might live in situations where they are constantly in hypotonic, like living in the bathtub. Like if they had to live in the bathtub situation um, for the rest of their lives, they have to have something in place 
so that they are able to survive that because they still have to have functions inside of their cell. So bacteria and amoebas that live in fresh pond water, the bacteria, um, the cell wall is just holding everything in place. Yes, it's constantly just like puffed out, but it maintains everything, it's fine. And then amoebas have vacuoles. Remember those are like packaging vesicles that usually hold like food or water for like a plant cell. But now they're using contractile vacuoles. That means using those vacuoles to push water out. So they will, as the cell soaks up water, package the extra water into that vacuole and then just push it out of the cell constantly doing it. So that's what amoebas do. That obviously, if you're doing something like that, that's gonna require a lot of energy because that's not normal. You're going against the nature, basically. Anytime you go against nature and you need to go against nature, then you need to be putting in energy. Um, there are bacteria that also live in salt. Basically, they have grown accustomed to having salt inside of their cells all the time. So they're saltier in their cells than we are because they live in this. That's how they have accommodated it. So if you were to take them and put them in a no normal quote unquote bacteria environment, that would be hypotonic for them and it could kill them because they're used to being in such hot salt. So pretty interesting. Oh gosh, okay. Transporting across the membrane. Uh, we're talking here about simple diffusion. Diffusion in general, right? We already know. Diffusing, anytime you see that word, high concentration to low concentration. Mountain of bouncy balls, you let it go and it rolls out and flattens out. That's all that's happening with the diffusion normally, okay? Simple diffusion, like we had with the water molecules across, across the membrane. It's just going to be doing it on its own. There's nothing crazy going on. Facilitated diffusion, we're still moving with that gradient, high to low concentration, but like things like protein, like it shows in the picture, can't cross on their own. We've already said that, right? Water can, but not much else. So uh, if the protein needs to get across, we can use that concept of facilitated diffusion, put a channel in place in the actual cell wall, and we're still moving with the gradient. So we're not fighting any energy or anything like that. Um, it's still diffusion, but now we have a channel for it to go through. That's the whole idea. Until it is equal on both sides. Um, facilitated diffusion, we can have saturation and competition. Saturation, um, all of those little green channels being completely taken up and you just can't transport anymore, right? Um, then we have competition. Um, some things like we have the green channel that transports the purple protein. Maybe there's another protein that needs to get through that's a red protein. If there's too much red, then the purple wasn't going to get to go across as much, right? That's the idea with that. So it's just competing to go across the channel or saturating the channels to the point that you get backed up and you have a buildup of whatever it is trying to get across. Next, we have active transport. It says what it is in its name, right? We had simple diffusion and uh, facilitated diffusion. Diffusion. This is active now. Any time you see active anything, there's something that the cell has to actively do, it's gonna require energy. So active transport, if you need to stockpile a whole bunch of potassium in your cell because you're gonna release it out in some sort of like nerve impulse or whatever, if you have to build up something against a gradient, then you use active transport. So um, that's gonna require energy because you're going again. So it's like taking all of those bouncy balls that might be all over it. You want them in a pile in the corner or back in your kid's toy bin or whatever it is. You have to go pick it up, right? It's not gonna do it on its own. When you let them out, they did it on their own. That's diffusion. But now that you want it back against what is natural, you're gonna have to go pick it up and put energy into it. So that's, that's the idea. It really is. So that's the idea of um, active transport. We have pumps for ions like potassium, sodium, and uh, proton pumps across the membrane. These are very important in controlling nerve impulses if you haven't taken physiology yet. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> sometimes they can just go across like the protein channel thing. We'll recognize that, the, that, you know, the thing you're trying to transport across is there and then it changes its shape and that allows it to go across via the help of ATP usually. Um, that can be enough. Other times you can have carrier proteins that will bind with whatever the other molecule is. And when those come together, then they can go across. But there's all sorts of ways they can do it. It's usually going to be driven by ATP. It says here, um, when we're dealing with carrier-mediated active transport, 
in uh, active transport process, we can use ATP or the proton motive force. And when we start talking about the metabolism, hopefully that will make sense. Proton motive force it is the point of everything um, up to the ATP step. So you're trying to create all of these excess protons, which are positively charged, outside of the cell, you have this massive, massive buildup. How do you get the protons across though? You're trying to build up excess protons outside of the cell. And now we have high, high positive charge outside of the cell. They don't want to keep going across, right? So how do they get across? What makes them go across? Well, it turns out the proton motive force What's happening is you're moving electrons, which are negatively charged, across through other proteins in the membrane. And as those negatively charged electrons go by, we're able to shoot those protons outside of the cell. And that's what drives that. So it's a different mechanism than the ATP-driven forces, right? We're using the movement of these negatively charged electrons to pump the positively charged protons out. And that creates that proton motive force. But um, we'll talk about more of that in later. Because yeah, you need that you need that um, positive on the outside of the membrane if you're going to make ATP. But we'll get to how that works later. So these are just examples like uh, endocytosis, which we're going around eating things up. I keep talking about phagocytes, right? How they come around and they eat things up, um, and moving that membrane and pinching around a little vesicle like that obviously <laughs> is going to take energy. That's all this is talking. It's active transport. Uh, we talked about phagocytosis, eating, that's cell eating, the so cells eating larger molecules. And we also have uh, pinocytosis. This is basically, I always think of like Pinot Noir when I see it, but um, little, they, we say it's cell drinking. That's how we refer to it. But um, oils or solution-based molecules. It's cell drinking, really, taking little sips. Um, things that influence... Michael, you already kind of know this stuff. Go figure that pH and radiation would affect an organism. Um, so they can, of course, have preferences for temperatures that they might grow at. Whatever your temperature preferences are, we call those your cardinal temperatures. Your minimum of what you can live at, your maximum of what you can handle, and then what you prefer. Those are your cardinal temperatures. Um, do, 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 do. If you get too high, your proteins get denatured, right? denatured being they lose their shape because those hydrogen bonds are being broken apart from heat. And that can kill microbes pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's we can define microbes based on their temperature preferences. Um, yeah, this is psychrophile, not psychophile. Psychrophile and then psychrotolerant, okay? Psychrophile. Obviously, we're talking about file being love here, just like we've always been saying with that. So psychro means cold. So these are the ones that uh, actually flourish in the cold. Um, the psychro tolerant, they can manage in the cold, but not necessarily like prefer it, but they can manage better than your cells can. Um, mesophiles, this is just medium. That's what meso kind of means. But uh, that's like everything that we're used to in our environment, our pathogens. Um, and us, we all fall into the mesophile category. Then thermophiles that like high temperature, and then extreme thermophiles that are going to flourish at temperatures above boiling. Nuts, right? I don't need to go over these too much. I'm not that interested in these guys. Um, we do also have some microbes that are called thermoduric. This means they can survive uh, exposure to high temperatures. So they're just more resistant to temperature, and that's just a way of talking. So they endure during the temperature thermo. But yeah, mesophiles, these are the middle guys. Most of our pathogens fall into that. All right, um, atmospheric gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide have the most influence on microbial growth. Some organisms need carbon dioxide, certain concentrations of carbon dioxide to function. Um, but more importantly, we have oxygen there. And I've already mentioned to you guys aerobic respiration, right? We mentioned one version of an anaerobic respiration, which was fermentation. There are other versions of anaerobic respiration. Those are called anaerobic because an, no, aero, oxygen, air, however you want to look at it. Um, they do not use oxygen. They do not need oxygen. In fact, some of them, because they're not adapted to using oxygen in the aerobic respiration situation, they can't deal with toxic oxygen byproducts that are usually naturally made during that process. 
Um, so they don't have enzymes to get rid of toxic oxygen byproducts. And so if they're exposed to oxygen, they can actually die from being in oxygen too much. Um, that's not uncommon with organisms like Clostridium. Clostridium organisms are very strict anaerobes. However, they're also producers of endospores and their endospores are not affected by the oxygen. So that is one of those extreme conditions that Clostridium could be facing that could push them into generating those endospores. So just think about that. But yeah, so usually you can put our microbes into one of three categories. Um, microbes that use oxygen and can detoxify it. That's like us. We actually would fall into that category because we have to be able to do that too, not just the microbes. Um, those that can cannot use oxygen and cannot detoxify it. That's what I'm talking about with the normal clostridium vegetative cells. And those that don't use oxygen but can detoxify it. So they're probably adapted to dealing with it if they have to. These are the toxic oxygen byproducts I'm talking about. They can come from the environment, of course, things like um, ozone and stuff like that. That's fine. Uh, but also during your aerobic respiration process, because it's not a perfect process always because that's chemistry, why would it be? Um, we have these byproducts, the singlet oxygen, for example. Um, so phagocytes will make that on purpose to kill invading bacteria because someone can't handle that. Um, so we make it in aerobic respiration sometimes. We have it in our phagocytes in, on purpose to kill things. Um, and right, we can't have a buildup because I'll end up damaging the cell. That part makes sense. Because these are oxygen products that like, they don't, they're not stable typically. So it's like free radicals. That's basically what this is, right? Um, they are missing electrons or they want more electrons or they aren't supposed to be there basically as a molecule and whatever it is about them can be destructive to the molecules in your cells. So here, superoxide at O2 negative, that's the O2 like we normally would have, but it has an extra electron there. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. Just think of hydrogens per oxide, if you guys can't ever remember of that, that formula, because it's gonna come up a lot in the class. And then hydroxyl radicals, anytime you have OH negative groups, for whatever reason. These can be destructive. You need to be able to deal with them if you are an aerobic creature because you're near oxygen a lot, right? So we have two enzymes involved in this, superoxide dismutase. I feel like, you know, dismutase is just sort of saying that we're changing it up a little, changing the shape, but sort of like chemistry of it. This is that superoxide ion, the O2 negative. Basically just turning it into hydrogen peroxide, okay? That's what superoxide dismutase does to superoxide. Then after you have your hydrogen peroxide, catalase can turn hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. If you have ever put hydrogen peroxide on a cut or something like that and seen it fizz up, that's what's happening. It's this. You're breaking down your hydrogen peroxide that contacts with your skin into water and oxygen. The oxygen is what's making the bubbles. Cool? All right, so aerobes, they need the oxygen and they have to be able to deal with it. Obligate aerobes have to be in oxygen, cannot do another thing. That's like us, we're obligate aerobes, right? Facultative anaerobes can be aerobic or not, just depending on where their atmosphere. Really, I mean, they can just decide if they wanna ferment anaerobically or if they want to use aerobic respiration if oxygen is there, obviously. If oxygen is there, that's going to be a preferred mechanism because you make way more energy from that. Cool. So that's facultative. They can go back and forth. Microaerophiles. They don't need a lot of oxygen, so they can live in low oxygen environments. That's all that is. Anaerobes, in general, these are the ones that do not um, need oxygen at all. So these are the ones they can, if they are strict or obligate, they're usually not going to have the enzymes there to defend against any oxygen. They don't have any way. They can't tolerate free oxygen, um, those free radicals. So they die. Um, and we have the aerotolerant anaerobes. That, I like that term because it speaks for itself, right? You know, the anaerobes that normally, they don't need oxygen to live, but they can tolerate it if it's in their environment. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, the ability of the microbes to deal with pH. Some of them like acid, some of them like, you know, neutral, and some of them like 
IPH. It just depends on whatever you're dealing with. I don't know. Not that interested in these, but we do have acidophiles. Again, speaking for itself, loving the acid, and then um, alkalinophiles that like the bases or alkaline alkaline conditions. And remember that neutral is seven. Anything above seven is alkaline. Anything below seven is acid. Um, so yeah, if you're obligate, again, you have to be growing in an acid environment. That includes things like they said um, for making uh, pickles and stuff like that. Uh, okay, the osmotic pressure. This is where we were talking about if I put you in salt and your ability to live in that situation, right? So that creates uh, osmotic pressure. Osmophiles, osmophiles like that situation. So we also can um, call them halophiles. It's like a salt-based organism dealing with that. Usually it is salt. So halophile or osmophile essentially for our uh, purposes will be the same thing. Then we have the obligate and the facultative versions of these. Again, have to be in the salt. Those are the ones that adapted for that. And if you put them back in the normal environment, can't deal. And then the facultative halophiles that can resist salt, but they normally wouldn't prefer it. Also, there are guys that can handle radiation better than others. They have special pigments that can uh, deal with effects of radiation. I'm not just talking about gamma radiation or x-ray radiation, stuff like that like you might see from like Chernobyl. What I'm talking about is even like UV radiation. So the sun, basically. So that's where, that makes sense when I say about the pigments, but that can work for them in a lot of environments. Yeah, usually I'm talking about UV radiation. All right, then we have the ones that can deal with pressure. The deep sea microbes have to be able to withstand that high pressure of the deep sea up to a thousand times atmospheric pressure. Um, so that's barometric um, pressure or um, like it's saying hydrostatic pressure, saying if it's the water hydrostatic, but that's dealing with the, the pressure of your environment around you. So barophiles, if you guys didn't know, barometric is dealing with pressure. Um, they like the high pressure. They will not survive well. If you bring them out of the water, they'll just like burst doesn't work well. Sort of like the same way, like if you were, if you go down deep in the water and you hold your, you take a deep breath from your scuba diving gear and then you just swim as fast as you can up to the surface without exhaling anything. You hold your breath while you go up there. The air will expand in your lungs and your lungs will burst open. Like, well, that's a different thing. Yeah, so if you're down in the, it's similar though. If you're down in the water and your uh, body absorbs enough like nitrogen typically, uh, it could be nitrogen in the bloodstream or it could be oxygen in the bloodstream. But either way, if you get enough of it in your bloodstream of that gas, usually normal amounts fine. It's fine in normal situation. But as you go up, then that will expand, expand in your bloodstream. And that's the bend. Um, yeah, but if you hold your breath, you don't have to be very deep to do it. If you're scuba diving, um, that air will expand in your lungs and you'll burst like a balloon. Your actual lungs. Sort of like, I guess I've ever heard of like the deep sea vessels that used to like work really, really deep down. I know we heard about the one that like, uh, you know, exploded in on itself, that's fine. But um, they used to have these guys that would work down on like the bottom of like oil rigs. And they go down in, in like these pressurized vessels at this like on the legs of the oil rigs and go work on them, like even for like a few days at a time sometimes. Anyway, when they bring these guys up and they have to go through this depressurizing process that took like a really long time. Well, one time there was poor communication between these guys and there was a break in the seal where there shouldn't be. And literally every person in that thing exploded just instantly the second that seal was broken. That's a real story. That's terrifying. But that's what pressure can do to you. So, you know, kudos on those bacteria, I guess. I don't know. Um, moisture, of course, this kind of goes a little bit back to um, the osmotic pressure thing, but also in the fact that you need water to sustain your cells, right? So um, if you can be dehydrated or dried out versus not. All right, associations between the organisms themselves, we've got uh, symbiotic versus non-symbiotic relationships. Symbiotic, you are in close uh, relationships. It's usually required by one or, or the other or both organisms, okay? Non-symbiotic, you can have relationships with one another, but it's not required in your life cycle, right? So in symbiotic relationships, we have mutualism where we're both gonna benefit. I'm benefiting, you're benefiting, that they think that's where the mitochondria came from. 
Um, commensalism, one is benefiting, but the other one doesn't really care. And then parasitism, probably a lot of your gut bacteria are mutualism and commensalism, right? Um, just guts, gut bacteria just chilling. Uh, they're getting food from you, but they're not really doing anything for you. Some of them are though. And then we have parasitism, which we already discussed. If it's a parasite, it causes harm to the host while it's doing like this. All right, for the non-symbiotic, we have synergism. Um, basically, like it says, you're gonna be cooperating and sharing nutrients in a situation, but you don't depend on it in your survival. And then antagonism, where members are inhibited or destroyed by others, but again, not necessarily depending on that for survival of one or the other. Um, I'm gonna go through these because we already talked about these. I don't need to know any more than what I said. Yeah, because uh, with commensalism, the commensal is the one receiving the benefits and the cohabitant is just habitating with the commensal. So we already kind of know that. All right, then we have antibiosis down here. That's a version of the antagonism where like one, they're kind of competing essentially. Um, so with the discovery of penicillin, we had mold that produced a chemical, that penicillin, right? Um, it was defending off from bacteria in its environment. That's why it makes it. So it makes an antibiotic to keep bacteria from encroaching in on its nutrient territory. So that's why that was there. Um, that's the idea, an idea of antibiosis. Neither of those depended on those relationships, but it is something that exists and as a result of natural interactions. That makes sense, yeah. All right, we already know a little bit about biofilms. They can do this thing when they are like stuck up on each other and communicate with each other, sending the chemicals saying, oh, this is good. We've got the, you know, food or, oh, this is bad. This is, we're getting our teeth brushed all the time. Like this is not a good deal. That's quorum sensing. The ability to monitor chemical signals that are just naturally gonna be produced by the bacteria. Um, to monitor the size so they can respond appropriately to those signals. And we've talked about that. You have about one bacteria with a capsule and other extracellular material to keep it stuck in place. It's usually the same kind of stuff as the capsule and the slime layer. Other bacteria come in and stick with it and so on and so forth and gets bigger and bigger until it's so big that it can't maintain itself anymore and you might break off and go make yourself a new one. All right, bacteria, when they divide, they go through binary fission. Um, it's like not like mitosis, right? We're not going through all this stuff with the chromosomes and pulling them apart and all this stuff. They're just literally going to be doubling the cell, doubling everything in the cell, and then just making a wall in between and pinching it off. And that's it. That's binary fission. So equal size cells as a result of this. And they all do it this way. Um, so you can always, a, a generation time, like I'm saying here, doubling time, going from one cell to two cells, how long is that going to take that organism, for example? So each new fission cycle doubles the population. So going from one cell to two cells is one cycle. Going from two cells to four cells is the next cycle, and so on and so forth, each cycle doubling it. Um, so it's exponential, just like you can see here, just like we were talking about with PCR, right? They're PCRing themselves, if you will. So it leads to exponential growth. And we can plot that and based on, of course, not all microbes grow at the same rate. Um, for example, mycobacterium like tuberculosis, very, very slow growers, very slow. Um, leprosy, if you're trying to look at leprosy um, and study that, mycobacterium leprae has a doubling time going from one to two cells of 28 days. So it's a month basically, to go from one to two. So, <laughs> so that's not pop it in the you know, incubator and come back two days later. That's like pop it in the incubator and come back two weeks later or something, right? So it's, it's going to be nuts. Very hard to work with it. You really can't culture it practically. Um, so well, you can chart all this and look at the growth curve and see how your um, specific species grows and even use that as an identifier. Um, seeing how fast your thing can grow. Uh, you can track it throughout the time that it is growing, take little samples out of your little flask that you're growing it in and plate it as you go. Take like just little drops and put it on a little plate and see how many colonies you get. And obviously over time, this culture is growing more and more bacteria. But you can count that and actually quantify it and create these graphs. 
So the first phase is called the lag phase. It's where you initially are taking your sample and like swishing it around in the broth, right? And sitting there. At first, the bacteria are adjusting to the environment, responding to the fact there's new nutrients. Maybe it's a, a warmer or a colder environment, all that stuff. And it takes them a little bit. So it says about five hours there to adjust. Um, exponential growth phase, just what we were talking about. Now we are happy we see that everything's good and we're gonna start dividing. Then we'll reach the stationary phase where uh, dividing into new cells and dying are kind of becoming equal. At this point, we're starting to die, uh, but you're not seeing it go down because we're still dividing. Usually uh, we can reach like the max growth that that medium can sustain for that organism. And then the death phase, you've run out of nutrients, you can no longer support, or there's too many toxic waste products or something like that. And that's where you'll see die off of the cells altogether. All right, I don't need to go over it, I just said it. Um, yeah, so of course this is gonna affect what happens in your infection, right? Because you're not gonna have symptoms during the lag phase, but when you're going through that exponential phase, your, your uh, symptoms are gonna be increasing as well with the population of the bacteria as your body is responding to them. So of course that's gonna correlate well. Um, if you need to grow bacteria just continuously, we call that uh, the thing that you would use a chemostat. A chemostat just constantly keeps new media circulating. Um, otherwise you can look at the population turbidometry, li literally looking at how cloudy it is. You guys have seen how it gets cloudy when it grows. We can measure that cloudiness and determine the population size from that. Um, or we can just literally count them like with a microscope or using the um, colonies. Uh, we also have machines that'll count them too, of course, using lasers. So Coulter counter, and then a flow cytometer, you can use fluorescence and all sorts of stuff to label aspects of the cell. You can even use PCR as a means to quantify uh, the progress of a culture. If you're doing something a large, large scale, that might be a useful thing. And you can also measure the use of ATP and ATP waste products. So for chapter nine, geez, I didn't even get to 25. Uh, chapter nine, why are photoautotrophs um, the base of the food chain? That should make sense. Let me just look at chapter 25 and see what we're missing out. Just 25? That's nine. I thought I opened it. No, I didn't. Okay, biogeochemical cycles. You guys know how rain works, right? <laughs> Um, and, and then carbon dioxide, this is literally talking about how plants use the carbon dioxide, fix it into organic molecules, you eat it, it gets moved through the food chain, and then you exhale it as carbon dioxide and it goes back again. There's also um, combustion and stuff like that can play a part. We kind of talked already about nitrogen cycle when we talk about nitrogen in general. There are four basic types of reactions in nitrogen cycle. The uh, nitrogen fixation, ammonification, nitrification, and denitrification. I am never gonna ask you, by the way, this is on your sheet. I'm never gonna ask you to actually like, tell me what the chemical situation is going on with these, but I would just be aware that they are important as far as bacteria and their use and interaction with the environment providing nitrogen to other organisms, right? Okay, because I don't care enough about that. Um, but we understand that they do have an impact on plants and how they get their nitrogen. If you want to understand about it, there are slides in here about it. I just don't care. The soil is cool, I guess. I'm just not interested in it. If you go deep enough in the surface of the earth, even down, down, deep, deep, deep in the sea, you can pull up 35 million year old bacteria that are still alive. And they, yeah, they're still alive and they can still metabolize, but they metabolize so slowly that um, researchers could never get them to grow because they don't double except like once, like every like three years or something. It's really slow how they grow, but they've been living under the mud for so long. They don't have any competition or anything. So that's crazy. Uh, whenever in the ocean, uh, plastic can build up and create little islands that can create like uh, bacteria uh, to grow where it shouldn't be and where there's light blocking and all of that stuff. You guys know about pollution. It's bad. Red tides, I don't care about really. 
This is the plastosphere. Yeah, obstructs sunlight, creates health risks for fish, of course. We've got a uh, growth of bacteria where they shouldn't be. I don't really care about freshwater communities. There's plankton are great and they gave us our oxygen in our environment, but I just don't care about them that much. Um, let's see. Obviously, I don't care that much about chapter 27 in case you guys haven't figured that out. I don't, I'm probably never going to ask you about lakes. Just saying. Who cares? All right. So the only thing that I would get out of chapter 25 is water contamination, filtering, and treatment and stuff like that. That's the more important thing. That's in here. Sure, the cycles, but most people can just glean that from just common sense. Uh, so water. Most of the time, water is going to be coming from an aquifer from down underneath the earth. That's typically where it's going to be um, coming from, and we will uh, treat it accordingly uh, to make it clean for you to consume at your home. This usually, it'll go through coagulation, so um, getting the particles that are in that to become larger so we can filter them out easier. Sedimentation, that's letting it settle, and we're going to filter it three, and then disinfect. That's usually going to be UV light and chlorine treatment. Right. Um, I had the water tested at my house in Bethany, I want to be clear. Um, and it had high, you can use chlorine, but the cheaper way to treat water is with um, chloroform. And that's what Bethany uses, I'm just saying. So if you live in Bethany, then you're probably drinking a lot of chloroform. Yeah, it's the worst water in the entire metro area by far, by far. I'm talking, it is almost illegally bad. Like it's right under the line. And the reason it's so bad is it combines Oklahoma City water, which is bad already. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's very hard water. And combines that with their own water, which they like, I don't know if they don't know how to treat water or something, but they have a lot of like E. coli outbreaks and stuff like that there. So it's like, you know, boil water and shit like that. I have an R, I have a reverse osmosis RO system. So I'm just like, well, we're not doing that. That's <laughs> it is. Uh, of course, in other parts of the world, sewage is an issue. They don't have the same water treatment abilities that we do, right? Um, and they don't aren't aware that it's a problem, usually. They don't know because it's how they've been living their lives for so long in um, underdeveloped countries. So their sewage usually is going to be found in the same places that they are washing and, um, you know, getting their drinking water from and that sort of stuff. That is actually a pretty serious thing to be considering. So that's a problem in underdeveloped countries, but what do we do about sewage in our environment? Because when you use the restroom and you flush it, what happens to that after that, okay? So first we're gonna be separating out large matter. You don't need me to tell you about this, right? Anything that is large that can be you know, separated out first, we're gonna do this. Then we are going to have um, a settling and breaking down by certain bacteria and stuff. Um, they breaking down the sludge. <laughs> and so that's this stuff it's basically like as the uh particles that didn't get skimmed out are settling and getting broken down it's that stuff that settles more and more at the bottom and then it should be getting broken down more and more by other anaerobes and whatever else but they use bacteria and stuff to break down that sludge then we're going to filter the water that's left over and they'll keep doing that maybe a couple of times even just to be sure that they're getting as much water out of it as they can because they don't want to be wasteful. That's a true thing. So um, the next thing they're going to do is the same thing that they did to your drinking water, which is filtering and chlorination, usually a bit more rigorous than um, the other one because we've had poop in there. Um, and the solid waste that is left over that was skimmed off or that wasn't eaten by part of the sludge uh, situation, um, they can use that for um, all sorts of stuff. I don't want to say... But yeah, fertilizer, they can apply it to land to give nitrogen back to the soil and whatever. So we want to be sure that we are checking our wastewater and surveilling it to make sure that we're not having poop get through, right? Uh, so we're gonna do all this testing on it. When COVID came out, they found out, I, I'm sure you guys remember too, it was kind of, I don't wanna say late in the game, but it was a while into the outbreak that they discovered that it is transmitted in waste. Um, it turns out that COVID can infect pretty much any cell in the body, which they didn't know, um, but actually likes the gut quite a lot. And um, so when you go to the bathroom and you have COVID, you're flushing that down the toilet, that wasn't getting filtered out because they don't accommodate for a lot of viruses just because like it, 
it's, they're tiny and that requires a lot of filtering. Um, they used to be very uh, vigilant about that sort of thing whenever they used to filter out polio. Polio is waterborne and only exists in people. No other animals get polio. And it's one of the smallest viruses that exist. And so we started filtering our water and of course vaccinating. And those two things helped eliminate polio almost completely from the whole world. It still exists in Afghanistan, Pakistan, but that's the only place that it's known to exist. And um, so we had a situation in place to deal with polio and filter out polio virus. And if you can filter out polio virus, it can filter out COVID. So that's what they started doing. They went back to filtering it like that to be sure that your water was safe. And you're like, okay, well, that's not my drinking water though. It might later become though, as this process throughout the ecosystem. Now, whenever you have filtered out water like this, you want to be sure that you're not including any of these guys when you pump it back into the system, right? Whether it's gray water or not gray water, right? Um, so Giardia, Cryptosporidium, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, Vibrio, Mycobacterium, Hepatitis A virus, Norwalk virus, and the bad um, E. coli bacteria. There's some that are fine, but only that. So what we do is we can't always test for these guys all the time. And if they're not there, that doesn't mean that they couldn't be there. It's the actual process effective. That's what they want to know. They don't want to wait until it comes out that everybody's getting Shigella in the environment, right? They don't want to wait for that. So what they do is they use these indicator bacteria, which are normal species in, the, in birds and in mammals and people, everything, things like E. coli, normal E. coli, um, and Klebsiella and stuff like that. Like it says here, these are coliform bacteria. These are back there, such a back there, all these. They are gram negative, lactose fermenting, gas producing bacteria. They just are gut bacteria, right? And um, <laughs> basically, you're going to be testing your water samples for these. You would filter the water out um, and then put the little filter itself onto some auger and then see if anything grows on it. Count the number of colonies. They are allotted a certain number of colonies in filtered water. If you think that's not how all of your food and water works, I hate to break it to you. There's a limit. They're allowed. I know because I tested this stuff. That's what I did before this. So um, yeah, so that's what they'll do. That, those are called coliform assays. The coliforms are the indicator bacteria that we use to identify the uh, gut bacteria in your clean water. Um, so now they're trying to look just for E. coli because they're not sure that it matters to look for the other guys. I don't know. Um, just counting, filter, growing it on filter. This is typically what we would do at my lab. It was we would get a water sample. We would filter the water sample and put the little filter literally down on the auger, let it grow overnight, and then count the colonies the next day. And sometimes there'd be a lot of samples. Like uh, there was like even things like marinades and stuff from Applebee's and stuff like that. I think I've told some of you guys this, McDonald's, they test the best by far, by over anybody, McDonald's, okay? Um, not so much the case with like Applebee's and stuff, like bigger, like actual restaurant, restaurants don't do it as well, usually. Um, people are usually like, oh, sit down restaurants should be better, but no. All right, we already know about bread. We know we can use yeast to uh, make gas. Uh, beer, uh, we're making alcohol with our yeast. And there's all these processes that I'm never going to test you on involved in this. If you're interested in beer and making beer, there are slides on that. And then one health is just dealing with our health affecting our environment and the environment affecting our health and everything like that. So, um, and how the environment, as we have encroached into different territories and as the weather has changed and everything like that, has changed um, in outbreaks with things like HIV or Ebola or whatever it is. As we're moving into... Um, I don't know, having increase, for example, having an increase in temperature averages, we will have an increase in mosquito populations further north and further north and further north. That means they're carrying with them the diseases that they also carry. Things like West Nile or Zika, that sort of stuff. That you otherwise wouldn't have seen. Um, but yeah, this is just talking about that and how these things came, potentially came about. Um, Mosquito-borne illnesses are the easiest one, I feel like, to go over. Um, and this is, I'm not kidding. This is talking about how they are, they're, you know, surmising that COVID started, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's it, right? Yeah. 
All right, here's your picture. Sorry, we went a little bit over. Uh.